Dear Father, we're so grateful for the opportunities that you give us. Help us not to spurn them. Help us not to neglect to do our duty. There's a great field that we need to reach out to. Give us that love, that tenderness, that desire. Spur us on, Lord. Help us to reach those in need. In your name I pray. Amen. You know, life for Gina in her late 30s had finally caught up to her. Her sedentary job, lack of exercise, a predilection for snacking, and a nightly Taco Bell habit had led her to gain weight and slowly, subtly, less well until one day she felt downright awful. Headaches, fatigue, poor interrupted sleep, depressed. She knew she needed help. She learned of a health program in her community and decided to take advantage. As the program began, she had her blood pressure checked. She was shocked to see that her systolic blood pressure was above 180. The force of her blood pushing on her blood vessels was way too high and it was hurting her. Gina knew it was time to make a change. You know, God in his love and wisdom chose to make us completely dependent on the force of blood in the physical sense and also in the spiritual. Physically, for example, if the heart stops, in as little as three to eight seconds, there is complete loss of consciousness. And if the heart does not restart within four to six minutes, irreversible death to organs and vital brain cells occurs. We are truly dependent on every beat of our heart via the flow and pressure of our blood in our blood vessels every moment of our life. In Leviticus 17, 14, if you want to turn there quickly, there's a very fundamental principle of life stated there Leviticus 17:14 it's written for the life of all flesh is its blood for the life of all flesh is its blood just think about that for a second you know and so as we went through our 4 weeks with our blood pressure class we looked at not only the harmful effects of the excess force of blood on our bodies, as seen in high blood pressure, but we also looked at several God-given natural ways to improve it. Using a book called 30 Days to Natural Blood Pressure Control, we used the No Pressure Solution, and it's an acronym, N for nutrition, O for optimal choice of beverages, P for physical exercise, R for rest, E environment, stress control, S, S for stress, con- uh, stress management, S for social support, U is use of natural adjuncts, R is refraining from pressors and excesses, and E is exercising faith in God. And so these factors we looked at, and they're key to improving health and improving blood pressure. And so this is God's gift to us, these natural things that he gave us in love. But these topics are not the topics you historically hear about at your doctor's office when you see him for high blood pressure. In fact, a recent analysis of visits to the primary care physician for high blood pressure, it doesn't even mention those topics. Medications were the only focus. For many, in fact, the focus on blood pressure medications is such high, uh, uh, of such high importance that the more natural options get neglected by default. And so the simple options that may be much more important than we realize are treated as foolishness. And so you can imagine my delight when I ran into a study in the journal Hypertension 
that was showing the potent effects of a seed as simple as flaxseed. It showed that flaxseed was excellent for your blood pressure. Now, I knew that, you know, it was good for you, considering it's anti-constipating, anti-depressive, anti-inflammatory, joint protecting, anti-atherogenic, anti-diabetes, anti-breast and prostate cancer, prostate cancer, skin improving effects, but the blood lower blood pressure lowering properties were impressive too. In fact, those with high blood pressure lowered their systolic blood pressure 15 points just taking flaxseed every day. Can you believe it? That little seed? Could you imagine going to your doctor the next time and he prescribes you flaxseed for your blood pressure? Indeed, that which is foolishness to men is the power of God. And, there, and it's written in Holy Scripture, 1 Corinthians 1.20, Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And so by picking and eating the flaxseed, it's amazing. Just think about it. That flaxseed dies for us so that we can live and receive a blessing. In the same way, each of us must die. That is, our old selfish enjoyments and unhealthy desires must die. They keep us lonely. They must die. They must be put out to rot, become despised, repugnant to us until they are totally withered and gone. You know, Jesus brings out this concept in John 12, 24. Why don't you turn there with me really quickly. It's an amazing section. He says in verse 24, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. You know, unfortunately, the wisdom of man doesn't think this way. Instead of learning this principle of here, the grain of wheat, or in my case, here, the flaxseed, the principle of the flaxseed, we are working hard many times to get our blood pressure down by ourselves with our own half-hearted efforts, often with medications. Even when we use lifestyle and God-given approaches, we often take the white-knuckle approach. When we are going to, when are we going to give up the unhealthy desires and enjoyments? Isn't it about time? You know, um, as you look at the trends of awareness of high blood pressure, it's dramatically increased over the last 50 years, 60 years. In the 70s, it was about 50% of people who were who had high blood pressure, were aware of it. Now we're almost 90% of people who have high blood pressure, we know are aware of it. But despite this, very few are actually controlled with their blood pressure. As of um, the 70s, maybe it was 10%, and it has improved some over the years, so that over the last 10 years, it's about 50% are controlled. So half of people with high blood pressure have control of it. Clearly, our own efforts are not working very well. In fact, are we, are we really trying that hard at all? Do we need to just try harder? You know, and if you break it down by medication type, it doesn't look any better. You know, the... Uh, the best medication, the adherence rate, is only 65%. Some of the medications are as low as 28% adherence. You know, and why is this? Maybe it's because we don't understand ourselves. The Bible spells out the reason. Let's turn to Romans 7.18 really quickly. We're going to be dancing through Scripture a little bit here. Romans 7.18 
I hope you've read this text before. It's very impactful when you really realize that this applies to me. It applies to you. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. According to this text, there is something inside of us that keeps us from accomplishing the good things we need to do. And if you think of Jeremiah 13.23, you don't have to turn there. Jeremiah 13.23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. That's us. That's me. Have you ever acknowledged that in your heart? That's me. That's us. That's the human race. Jeremiah also says in 17.9, this one hits me every day almost. Every day I think about this almost at some level. It says in 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't even know ourselves what is in us. Indeed, the biblical authors recognize something is amiss in our human hearts. I love the example of the prairie vole and the meadow vole in the animal kingdom. It's a relative of the mouse and hamster. And the prairie vole and meadow vole, they are identical except for one important distinction. And there's a lot of them found in the Midwest. The prairie vole is monogamous for life, while the meadow vole is completely promiscuous. In fact, when raising children, the prairie vole male spends 60% of his time in the nest, working on the nest with helping his female. Wouldn't that be nice, females? Amen. <laughs> while the female meadow vole raises her children alone. You hear that? The, the male metal vole is very promiscuous. The difference appears in this case to be genetic. The prairie vole, in the prairie vole, the oxytocin and vasopressin receptors are in the areas of the brain associated with reward and pleasure. And, the, and oxytocin, of course, is the love hormone. And, we, uh, and it's a bonding hormone. We know this very well. While the, in the metal vole, these receptors are absent in these reward centers. The stark contrast in bonding habits is remarkable and speaks to the brokenness that increasingly exists within nature. Could it be that there are also broken genetic, physical, emotional, and social pieces within us that lead us to desire to do the wrong things? Let's turn to Matthew 26, 40 and 41 quickly. You know, Jesus himself affirms the same experience here. In the struggle in Gethsemane, after having asked his disciples to pray for him, he found his disciples sleeping as he prepared for his crucifixion, which turned out to be the most crucial moment, the hardest trial of his life. Here were his disciples, supposed to be there for him, helping him, learning from him, and yet they're sleeping. And so we see there in Matthew 26, Jesus said to them, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. There, Jesus is tapping into some of the core structure of who we are, sleeping while our master is going through the greatest agony of his life. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
Let's go back to John 12 for a second. Sorry to make you move through Scripture. Hopefully, hopefully your fingers are nimble today. Let's go back to that story in John 12 for a minute. Where Jesus talks about the dying grain of wheat that I quoted before. Let's look at the context for a second. Jesus was heading to Jerusalem before the Passover where he was anticipating his death. On the way, he heard from his disciples that there were some Greeks that were seeking to, to see him. They said, we want to see Jesus. But look at the response of Jesus there. Right after the disciples came, in verse, um, let's see, verse 23. But Jesus answered them and saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. This was a very unexpected response, I would say. These Greeks want to see him, and this is Jesus' response. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified, as in that he should die. Some might say that he was saying that he couldn't turn aside and take time to see them because the time of his death had come, and that was true. But I think it's as if he was saying, they want to see me, they are going to see me. They're going to see me die. Then they will really see me. The character of Jesus was going to be manifested as he was heading into Jerusalem for the last time. And amazingly, the very next, next verses begin to unpack this idea of a seed or a grain falling into the ground and dying. It says there, verse 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And so John 12 here shows us that there is a great irony with God. If you keep your life, you lose it. If you give away your life, then you keep it. And Jesus here, anticipating his own death, he says later that his soul was troubled. And while he's thinking about this and anticipating this crucifixion process, he brings out this concept of the grain of wheat dying so that much grain may come. It's a great illustration in nature for what Jesus did for us and also what we need to do in our own lives to have the fruit to be bo born in health and in life. The concept is stated even more particularly in Hebrews 9.13, which we read for our scripture reading. Thank you for that. Let's turn that to there uh, right now. Let's read this again, and, and I want you to really think about this, these texts. It's amazing. Here, Paul is unpacking all the concepts about the sanctuary, the earthly and the heavenly sanctuary, and, and starting to unpack that for us and what that means in light of Christ's death and uh, uh, resurrection. And it says in verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh... Stop right there for a second. You know, I, thinking about my story at the beginning that I started of Gina, 
I think of her when I read this. She wanted to purify her flesh. She was tired of her unhealthy, sick experience. She didn't want to be like that anymore. She wanted to die to that old experience and find a new experience. And so the concept there was that in the Old Testament, they used to sacrifice bulls and goats and so on to, quote, purify the flesh. But look at verse 14. What we get to know about because of Christ, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Did you see that? Could it be that this same concept is illustrated in blood? Is there a force in blood? Is there a force in the blood of Christ that can make me live like I've never lived before? Amen? Is there a force that can empower me to have good habits, good health habits, good moral habits, to do the good that I actually want to do? Is there a power? Amazingly, even though the life-giving blood that flows through our broken flesh ends in death, this verse says that with the shedding of blood, there comes life. Did you hear that? This is the spiritual principle, the irony of God, that is foolishness to the mind of men. Do you understand it? There's something powerful in Christ, in the blood of Christ, that cleanses my conscience, not only in forgiveness, amen for that, but also for, for living works, that works may arise out of the dead to serve God. And you know, when it comes to health, I think this is the only thing that can ultimately, over time and, and at any time, really make it happen. People may, for a period of time, be able to reform certain things. They may be able to improve upon certain things because of willpower efforts. But the only thing that fundamentally changes the human heart is Christ alone and his sacrifice for us in the blood of his uh, sacrifice and shedding. And when it comes to the force of blood story, you know, the irony has been there right from the beginning, of course, whether we're speaking about high blood pressure or speaking of the loss of the force of blood through the shedding of, of blood. You know, and, and I just want to take a moment to look at the first time we know of, and, and I know that some of you heard this before, but uh, bear with me. When blood pressure was measured and in, in essence discovered, the man who did it was Stephen Hales, and the funny thing about Stephen Hales is that he was a minister. They called him a curate in England, in Teddington, as part of the Church of England in the early 1700s. Then a full 200 years into the Reformation, God had placed the dangerous idea into thousands of men and women that the common man could read, explore, and understand the Bible and learn about God for themselves. They didn't need a priest to do it for them. And this dangerous idea had spread into many areas of life, including music, art, nature, science, and engineering, etc. It was a time of great experimentation and discovery as the darkness of the dark ages ended. And so this minister, Hales, saw his experimental work, and you'll hear it in a second, as a duty to discover and wonder at the wisdom and goodness of God by studying his creation. Of course, you have to give him a little grace. They were coming out of some of the greatest darkness that you could possibly imagine. And he's recorded as saying, since animal fluids move by hydraulic and hydrostatic laws, the likeliest ways, therefore, to succeed in our inquiries into the nature of their motions is by adapting our experiments to those laws. Amazing that the minister would talk like this. Usually you hear it more from the science guys like that. And so what he did is he took a horse and he 
discovered blood pressure. And I'll read you briefly his summary of what he did in one of the books that, he, uh, r- that was written about him. In December, I caused a mare to be tied down alive on her back. She was 14 hands high and about 14 years of age, having an abscess or fistula on her withers. So she had a deadly condition, was neither very lean nor very lusty, having laid open the left cural artery, which is on the shoulder, about three inches from her belly. I inserted into it a brass pipe whose bore was one-sixth of an inch in diameter, and to that, by means of another brass pipe, which was fitly adapted to it, I fixed a glass tube of nearly the same diameter, which was nine feet in length, going up like this, up straight. Then untying the ligature on the artery, the blood rose in the tube eight feet three inches, perpendicular above the level of the left ventricle of the heart. Then it was, when it was at its full height, it would rise and fall at each and every pulse thereafter, two to three or four inches. Amazing. The discovery of blood pressure. We didn't have any idea about this until the 1700s. Can you believe it? This phenomenon or concept we consider as absolutely basic to our thinking today. Isn't that right? I mean, what's the first thing that happens when you go to the hospital? Take your blood pressure. I mean, it's, it's as basic as it gets. And yet here, Stephen Hales discovers it. There's a quote from Werner Forsman who gave a Nobel Prize recipient speech Uh, for his development of cardiac catheterization. And this is what he said of Hales. Stephen Hales was also the first in 1727 to determine arterial blood pressure when he measured the rise in a column of blood in a glass tube bound into an artery. And you know, I think of that story, and I think uh, just as important a story as that story is is the story of that horse who gave his life up. This horse gave up her life and and the force of blood, blood pressure, was understood. And as a result, many thousands of lives have been improved and saved because of it. And isn't this, my friends, the story of the cross of Christ? Isn't this the story of each of our lives? But how much more Christ, who gave up his life willingly, while the horse gave it unwillingly. The Apostle Paul states the same idea in 1 Corinthians 1.18. If you want to turn there. 1 Corinthians 1.18. It's a fascinating concept that really gets to the core of the matter as it pertains to this idea of wisdom and foolishness of God. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The lesson learned from the discovery of blood pressure as illustrated in the death of the horse initiated powerful insights into blood pressure that would be added to over the centuries, improving the health of millions. In the same way, the death of Christ, which seemed like foolishness at the time and a complete waste of time, initiated an explosive saving force upon the world that is being multiplied upon to this day. Isn't that true? Is it not being multiplied upon to this very day. And that's the irony with God. Yes, the irony of God is this. The spiritual principle is this. The life is in the blood, but the shedding of blood gives life. This discussion brings up a good question. What does this teach us about how we can overcome in our lives? What does this teach us about our own struggles 
to give up unrighteous things. And you know, anything that is selfishly bringing injury to our own bodies, that's unrighteous. For it says in Exodus 20, thou shalt not murder. And so we ought not to be doing things selfishly that harm and injure and bring death to our bodies unnecessarily. At a fundamental level, it means that the usual ways we naturally go about to make changes in our lives as well need to be rejected. God is calling us to give up our ways and to give ourselves to him. Perhaps you have evil desires in the area of food and drink, laziness, an unwillingness to engage in physical activity, an unwillingness to go to bed on time, to turn off the TV or stop looking at your computer late into the night. Maybe it's an addiction that has haunted you or a, will, a willingness to forgive someone who hurt you or reconcile with a family member to learn to be kind and gentle even to those who are rude and mean. Whatever the thing is that you're struggling with, that the Holy Spirit is laying on your heart, how is it that we can overcome it? You know, in Psalms 37, 5 and 6, it says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Who does it? Who does it? Do we do it? Do we do it? It says right there, who does it? Turn with me to Luke 5 for a second. I want to take a a minute here to look at this amazing passage. Just moves me every time I read it. Here Jesus is relatively early in his ministry. And Luke is telling stories about the amazing healings that Jesus did. And if you look at verses 12 through 26, there's two stories there. One about a leper and the other about a paralytic. And in both stories, which I'm sure you're familiar with them, the first story being that a man full of leprosy went and laid himself in front of Jesus, fell on his face, You can see there in verse 12 and 13, saying to him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And also the story of the paralytic, here are his friends trying to bring him to Jesus. And they couldn't get into him because of all the people surrounding and in the house. And so what they did in verse 18 is, Uh, It says, Behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And so my question today for you, My friends, are you looking for healing? Have you seen all the doctors and no one seems to know how to help you? Have you ever wondered why God doesn't heal? Why doesn't he heal a certain person? The answer here is go to Jesus. Casting yourself completely onto him like the leper did, falling face down, knelt before him on his knees, if you look at the various sto- renditions of the story. And the second thing, I, I, um, or before I get to that, the paralytic also, what did he do? They didn't let anything hold them back. They didn't let the crowd, they didn't let the people, they didn't even let a, a roof hold him back to get to Jesus. So what's the first thing you do when you're struggling with a bad habit, something you want to change. What's the first thing you do? You go to Jesus. You go to Jesus. You don't let anything hold you back. You follow the example of the leper and the paralytic. It's amazing that 
God is able to do this. And so what does he do? What does Jesus do when we come to him, humbling ourselves, laying ourselves before him? What does he then do? Is it something that we do to get him to do something? Well, we come to him. That's all we have to do. But all the rest is his job, is it not? The leper said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. What is, was Jesus' response? I am willing. Be clean. Boom. Just like that. With the paralytic, even before the paralytic said anything, look in verse 20. Jesus immediately, seeing the faith, their faith, that is the key. He said to him, man, your sins are forgiving you. And then, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? 22, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to him, to, to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise. Take up your bed and go to your house. This amazing ability that God has, just like it says in, in Psalm 37, that he shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. You know, this righteousness is something that only God provides. He is the only one who can do it. We just come to him helpless, full of need, desperate, in desperation. Imagine how desperate that leper was. Just think about the life of a leper at that time. Amazing. Shunned from the community, living alone, having to repeat, unclean, 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 endlessly. I mean, it says in, in Leviticus that they were commanded to cover their mouth while they said it. They had to cover their mouth. And so... These verses, I think, are telling us, give ourselves to God, give up your life for God, and God will make the righteousness happen. Amen? Amen. You know, there's a story that Lee Venden tells that I heard when I was just becoming a Christian. This cowboy had met this girl at this uh, inappropriate type uh, adult um, um, <coughs> place. And um, they had gotten together and they had eventually married. And they were still living a life. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know if there's some water. They were still living a life um, that was a life they didn't <coughs> appreciate or didn't. Uh <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, wasn't proud of. And he tells a story <coughs> about how he's preaching in this small Midwestern church where there's a lot of gray heads everywhere. And they walk in in the middle of the sermon and uh, walk down the middle of the church and sit in the front row. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, sometimes I tear up. And uh, after the sermon was finished, they um, approached the pastor, Ali, uh, and asked him for Bible studies. And so he started, began meeting with them and you know, initially as they were studying the Bible, the, the, the smoke was so thick over the Bible that he had to move his hand like this to see the words. And of course, um, she was dressed very uh, provocatively, and the cowboy was dressed like a cowboy. But over the course of the Bible studies, they kept coming to church and doing Bible studies. He noticed that there was these dramatic changes that were occurring in their lives. One day at the Bible, one of the Bible studies, he noticed they weren't smoking anymore. And they had been chain smokers, both of them. And he was surprised by this. 
And so he uh, asked them, hey, did you guys quit smoking? <laughs> and the cowboy looks at his wife. He's like, did you quit smoking? <laughs> and she's like, oh, yeah, I guess I did. And she turns to him, did you quit? And uh, he's like, yeah, I guess I did. They were t- so taken up by the love of God in their lives. They didn't even know that the thing left them. You know, that's not always the case. I know there's one specific example in my life where swearing left me. It used to be a big struggle. I used to swear a lot, and uh, it left me, and God just took it away. And sometimes God will do that. But sometimes God will let you struggle with something. Sometimes it'll be a really tough struggle to give something up. But what do you do? You don't worry about how tough the struggle is. You just go to Jesus over and over and over and ask him to change your mind, to rearrange your thoughts, to change what you love, to take away that love, to make it to, to feel completely repugnant to you. And guess what he does? He changes you, does he not? He will do that. The promise is sure. You know, um, almost 200 years after the discovery of blood pressure, that's finally when some of the insights into blood pressure started to be a blessing to us. This first happened in the late 19th century when life assurance at at that time they called it and mortgage companies were the first to realize that the higher the blood pressure, the greater the chances of dying at an early age. But it took a long time for this to be fully brought into the consciousness of the people. Uh, In 1931, John Hay, a professor of medicine at Liverpool University, said, There is some truth in the saying that the greatest danger to a man with a high blood pressure lies in its discovery, because then some fool is certain to try and reduce it. Despite the foolishness and underlying belief of the men like John Hay, God winked at such ignorance. And now, over 150 years later, almost 200 years later now, study after study, after research project after research project, have continued to bring truth to light, emphasizing the importance of blood pressure and the risks of excessive elevation to the point that he and McGregor, these uh, two authors, at St. George's University in London, boldly proclaimed in their article In the European Heart Journal in 2007, blood pressure is the most important cause of death and disability in the world. Here again, God's irony is on display. Blood pressure, otherwise known as the force of blood, which maintains life in every creature, is proclaimed here as the most important cause of death? And by contrast, the spiritual principle of God is again acknowledged. The blood of Christ shed for us is exchanged for the force of man through death, thereby initiating a more powerful force from God for us that our consciences may be cleansed from dead works to serve the living God. Indeed, the Apostle Paul gets it right again in 1 Corinthians 1.27 when he says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Here is why God required the shedding of blood in Leviticus 17.11. As I read before, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Did you hear that? It's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Life gives itself up to death so that this body of death may regain life. 
verse 18 in 1 Corinthians of chapter 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's where the power is found, in the cross. And so as I close here this morning, I just want to share this story again of my uncle. You know, my, when my uncle was a young child, perhaps three or four years old, and was growing up on a hospital compound in Nigeria, Africa, as the firstborn son of my grandfather, who was working there as a local missionary physician. One day he was playing in the house while his mother, my grandmother, was attending to duties in a nearby room. Then suddenly, having heard nothing of concern, she began to have a very strong premonition, a tremendous urge upon her mind to hurry, quickly, go outside at once to the well that had a heavy metal lid on it in the courtyard. She had a strong feeling that her son had fallen into the water. At once, she ran out the door to the courtyard. Nothing seemed amiss. No one was around. She didn't hear anything wrong, but nevertheless, she went to the lid. The heavy metal lid was closed upon the well. An unseen force pushed her on. She grabbed the lid and with two arms heaved it up And there was her son, gasping, crying out, struggling in the deep water several feet down, starting to sink. She reached down as far as she could and caught hold of him and with one great tug pulled him up to safety. She clenched him in her arms. She was so thankful that God in his mercy had revealed to her the situation her son had fallen into. Though she had no evidence from her senses that such a fact existed, just to think, if she would have waited a moment longer, he may have drowned. I think of that story. And I think of how many times we are floundering in the waters with our habits, with our addictions, with our ways of life. And I think of the struggle that is often manifested in our own blood through high blood pressure or other health conditions as we deal with the results of our own bad habits, sinful desires, ungodly choices. And sometimes in other cases, the results which came upon us apart from our choices. We may feel our bodies fighting as our blood pressure spikes. We may wonder if our hearts may finally give out. And then suddenly, when all seems lost, Jesus Christ lifts the lid within the darkness and grabs us and with one great tug pulls us to safety. You know, so many times we are floundering in life as my uncle was in the well. And you know, Jesus is there to pull you up out of the trouble. Do you wish to hold up your arm to him, to cry out to him, knowing how broken your situation is, how messed up things are? Do you wish to raise your arm today? To say, God, help me with these bad habits. Help me with this sense of brokenness that I have. I say to you, don't be afraid. He loves you and will take care of all that if you let him. Just lay yourself down before him. Reach out to him and grab his hand and let his power come into you and he'll pull you up out of trouble. You know, I want to say today to Jesus, I want to say, Jesus, make all the bad habits one by one. Work on whatever you need to work on and improve them in my heart today. 
And I'm raising my hand to say, do that in me, Jesus. Do that in me. And only Jesus can do it. It is his ability to make that which is broken better. Let me close in prayer and we can have the song here. Dear Lord, as we think about these powerful issues and the way our own hearts heave against them sometimes, the way our flesh rails against it. Help us not to be afraid. Help us just to go to you, to lay ourselves down before you, knowing that you are able. You have heaven and earth in your hands. You run the whole universe. You can take care of us. You have the power to help us to change those bad habits to get those health habits better. Help us to do it, O Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you, to know that in the blood of Christ, there is all power to make righteousness flow. Thank you for that. In your name I pray, amen.